Welcome everybody. I'm Raul Kazan from Two Celsius. Uh, we are um, having our third workshop, but the first on Central and Eastern Europe, related to what we call Rail Renaissance. This is a this is a project uh, sponsored by OIKI, so by the German federal government, um, and uh, brings uh, around uh, partners from Spain, um, France. Poland, Germany, and Romania. Um, well, uh, what we're trying to do right here is to draw the attention on what's happening in terms of uh, passenger rail services, uh, rolling stock, and infrastructure in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, I'm going to start with the participants here. Uh, I am <coughs> going to be the masters of master of ceremony, but uh, the first one to open the discussion will be uh, Wukash Janetski. I hope I pronounced well, Wukash. Oh, from... Not so bad, <laughs> Janetska. 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 Okay, from uh, from the Polish uh, Civil Affairs Institute, and uh, our uh, highlight of the day will be uh, 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 John Worth. And uh, he is um, the founder of the campaign Trains for Europe. You can find it at trainsforeurope.eu. And this campaign is looking to solve the problem of the absence of night trains in Europe. And he's demanding EU to organize procurement for new fleet of sleeping cars. He's uh, known in EU politics for his blog. He's blogging at johnworth.eu. Also, he teaches politics at the College of Europe in Bruges, and uh, he's currently based in Berlin. Uh, later, he's going to tell us about uh, his campaign on nine trains, which became pretty much a campaign that we embraced it in our project, uh, very much so. Uh, also, he's going to talk about uh, connecting Europe train because he's been in uh, on a, on a pretty long route in Central and Eastern Europe from uh, the Czech Republic, Poland, and uh, Germany, right? And Slovenia. And Slovenia, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about, about connecting Europe a little bit myself. So, uh, oh, I, I didn't present what I'm going to talk about, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about something where it's called the local development dimension of uh, passenger, uh, international passenger trains in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about money. Uh, so European money that are involved in, 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 in rail. So uh, with no further ado, I will ask uh, Wukash to uh, tell us what is uh, rail renaissance about. Yes, of course. Uh, I will tell you about our Europe on You're breaking um, up. Now, Did you see my uh, screen? Uh huh. Okay. Just one moment. Mm -hmm. Just a moment. I think for this, if people connect, just a moment. I try to prepare this. Okay. I think Lukash <clears throat> wants to present without video, that's uh, that's no problem. 
Lucas, go ahead. Is he is he still here? No, he's rebooting. Okay, can you hear me? Oh, perfectly, yes. Oh, that's... A bit... I, I don't know why I have a problem with uh, connection, as I see, but it's uh, Central Eastern Europe workshop, so it's normal. <laughs> it no, shows... No, no, no. I'm in Belgium, and the problems are here. No, in Central Eastern Europe, this has to go tip-top. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, I will try once again to share my screen. I hope that will be good. Did you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So, okay, good. Uh, okay. So once again, I would like to thank you for accepting the invitation uh, for today's workshop. Uh, before we start discussing about rail issues in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, we would like to introduce you the Europe on Rail Coalition uh, and encourage you to work with us. Uh, some of you may have participated uh, in our workshop for all NGOs, uh, which was in um, early June. Uh, but probably some of you are new and have less knowledge about us, so uh, we decided to um, say it about us. Okay, um, today we will tell you who we are, uh, why we decided to support the idea of uh, European passenger rail, uh, how we work, um, and why we need you. So, I mean, why we need and NGOs from all over Europe, Europe, especially NGOs from Central, uh, Central and Eastern Europe. So first of all, I will tell you about us. Um, so the Europe on Rail Coalition uh, consists of NGOs from Germany, France, Spain, Poland, and Romania. Uh, we are united by our love. Uh, by our love for lay, uh, experience in transport initiatives, uh, our advocacy and grassroots work, um, and our awareness that rail is the, the most friendly uh, transport for environment. And we know that uh, rail has a lot of potential, but so far this potential is untapped. Now we will tell you about our activities. So uh, why, we, uh, why did we decide to act? Because uh, rail can significantly help to realize the ambitious plans of the European Union. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, but we know that uh, people in Europe uh, doesn't live only by ecology. And um, if rail uh, should be chosen by EU inhabitants, it must be competitive, attractive, fast, and of course, cheap. Uh, that's why we need investments in rails and a common EU policy, which will help rails to return to their um, former glory. Uh, Europe needs advocacy, civic uh, and educational ag activities, encourage uh, cooperations between stakeholders, carriers. Uh, we know that only uh, actions on all, all fronts can be effective. Uh, all, it also requires uh, patience and uh, the pursuit of goals. Um, now in European, we have a European Year, uh, year of Rail, 
and uh, we think that our initiative should work for many years uh, until the goals are achieved um, so that the, the renaissance of rail doesn't become um, how to say hmm, maybe empty political slogan only so we think that no one is better in this kind of work that uh, NGOs. So that's why we decided to act. Um, also in our activities, we meet with uh, national and European decision makers, for example, members of European parliaments, uh, members of national parliaments, ministries, etc. Uh, we also establish cooperation with NGOs from all over Europe. Uh, we promote our activities uh, on, at rail and environmental congresses and summits. Uh, also, we listen to the voices of the rail enthusiasts, uh, activities, experts. Uh, finally, we also listen to the voice of citizens. Um, an, an example is the our poll we, uh, that we published uh, this year. Uh, we can uh, send uh, results of this uh, poll after the meeting. If you wanted to see what citizens uh, think about uh, European, European rail. Uh, and uh, and we uh, try to uh, strange the voice of uh, NGOs and citizens about rail. Okay, so uh, part of our work uh, also includes strategy documents to show the media, citizens, decision makers, and we show what are the main obstacles to realization um, conception of European passenger rail. We also uh, propose a concrete solution for Europe and individual countries. Um, so far, we prepared uh, a European document, which uh, was noticed by CNN or The Guardian. Uh, also, we publish uh, German, Spanish, uh, French and Polish documents. Uh, you can see these documents on our website. Uh, European document is in English. Uh, national doc documents is in national languages. Uh, I know that there will be also a Romanian document in the near future, so we wait for Romania and we are very curious about the problems in Romania. Uh, in, and uh, these papers are reaching decision makers and public. Okay, so now I will tell you why we need you. Uh, as uh, we have so far focused primarily on the countries of origins of the members of European Road Right Coalition, um, because, um, to be honest, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, closed by staffing and time resources, but we also want to expand our activities ac uh, across Europe. Um, today, workshop is organized by organization from Romania and Poland, and in our coalition, we put special um, special point on the countries of Central and Eastern Europe because this uh, region is particularly close to us. Uh, we also know that uh, main problems of this region um, and how much needs uh, to be done in our countries and your countries. So we cannot imagine uh, talking about European rail without the participation of the Baltic states, Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, Hungary, or the Balkan countries. So you are the most important. And the, the, that, that's why we care most about you. And uh, that is why we decided to, uh, to, to make this workshop to this region. And to, to the end, uh, I hope we stay in touch. Uh, on our website, you will find a contact form and uh, in the founding members tab, you found emails addresses to representative of particular countries. Um, if you wanted to ask uh, someone directly, for, for example, Raul, me or someone from France or uh, Germany, you can find, uh, find us on our website um, in founding members tab and you can write to us directly. So uh, I, I hope it, it, it will be done. 
uh, we would like, we would be happy to involve you in our activities. Also, we would like to support you in your actions. I advise you on, uh, of course, ask you for your opinion. Uh, and uh, also, we would like to invite you to follow our Twitter because we publish uh, in, uh, very curious and uh, important information about a uh, situation uh, connected with European um, rail. So uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. If you, if you have any questions, I am happy to answer them. Uh, if you prefer to ask me uh, later, feel free to contact me. Mm, uh, as I said before, you can find my email on our website under the description. Uh, after the description of uh, my organization, the Civil Affairs Institute, or you can write to Raul and he will certainly forward my email. So thank you very much. If you have any question, please, please ask now. Um, th thank you, Lukas. Um, everybody, please note that there is a free discussion after that. So, uh, you know, all those written questions, you can just verbalize them right here. Yeah, that's right. Um, can, can you stop this sharing, uh, Wilkash? But I, actually, I don't have to share anything, so uh, I, I'm just gonna talk. Uh huh. Yeah, for me, it's everything. Oh, I just have the same problem. Just one moment. Okay. For me, that's it. Thank you, Wilkash. Um, just one sec. Uh, okay. So before anything, um, I um, I would like to um, talk about the connecting Europe. Uh, train. So this is how I'm going to connect with with John. That that's going to present a little bit later. Um, I'm I'm, I'm going to have to tell you about the connecting Europe Express, the train, the special train that uh, you know rolled all over Europe, and it's going to end in Paris on the seventh of October. Um, um, this special train entered Romania uh, last week at the Ruse Giurgiu Bridge. Uh, over the Danube, uh, uh, but when it, it did not only enter Romania, uh, it, it got into some sort of a desolation row. Um, the short trip from the Bulgarian border to, to Bucharest, which was um, a little over, which is like a little over 60 kilometers, was very difficult. Now, for maybe Romanians know that, but for more than 15 years, um, Romania was not able to uh, rebuild the bridge over the river Argeș at Gredishtia. So instead of making like 40 or 50 minutes as it used to take, by the way, when I was a student, I, I, I took it to Sofia uh, via Ruse, and it was something like that, 45 minutes at best. Um, so connecting Europe did more than two hours in a detour from Georgia to Bucharest. Uh, that bridge, uh, I want to. What I want to stress here is that that bridge is a local and a national problem from a rail perspective. Uh, however, a couple of days before the arrival of the train of the special train in Bucharest, the Romanian government collapsed. So the minister of uh, transports has resigned. Uh, that guy was was quite an avid train buff. Uh, Conversely, the, um, the interim minister that followed him, um, and he was present at the conference along the commissioner for transport, uh, the Romanian Adina Volian, confessed publicly that he, he doesn't, he hasn't really taken the trains in the last um, decade. Well, anyway, the, commission for trans the commissioner for transport, uh, Adina Volian, had a press conference. Mihai has been there. He even took photos. One of the photos, probably you can see it here. Um, uh, she also expressed her disappointment that Romania hasn't managed to attract uh, too many European funds in order to invest in railways in general. Uh, in fact, Romania attracted somewhere around 5 billion euro uh, 
with which our country managed to modernize somewhere around 500 kilometers of rail. Uh, that is in the last five years, more or less. Uh, she said that most of the projects failed because of the instability of project governance. It's, it's very important what she's saying here. Actually, that instability was overt even a day before the European train entered Romania because the director of uh, Cefere Corridor, which is the passenger uh, state-owned uh, uh, train operator in Romania, Ovidio Vizante, announced his resignation because the state company has enormous problems and it's basically um, on the ledge of the abyss. And uh, Cefere did not have a boss at the Connecting Europe ceremony in, in Bucharest, which is absolutely ridiculous. So the train left uh, on its main route on uh, say 10T corridor, uh, but it's really important to, to, to underline here that between Brasov and Sibiu, it was dragged by a diesel engine. Uh, so, okay, this is comprehensive TNT. It, it's not really the main corridor, but still it's, it's really important. It's one of the most circulated uh, 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 routes on Romanian railways. Well, the speed was somewhere around 60 kilometers an hour, which was <laughs> pretty much the true average speed of Romanian trains on Romanian territory. Um, what, what I see here is that, that sometimes uh, bypassing the central government is not only the best option, but it's probably the only solution to actually get things done when it comes to rail and even to bigger, even to big other sorts of big projects. So um, what is important right now is no. that... Yeah, 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 totally. yes? yeah. I, Ivana is talking to me. No. So uh, this fall, the, uh, the revised 10T regulation, it's 1315 from 2013, uh, will come up. And um, the infrastructure at the very core of uh, railroad development in Central and Eastern Europe will be expanded. Now, coming back to Connecting Europe Express, uh, this train showed something pretty interesting. And that is the importance of nodes in the whole 10T network. And these nodes are a matter that leads to local development, to responsibility at local and especially regional level that sources in solutions of intermodality. For the mobility transition or the modal shift, either it is local, region, either regional or local authorities can make use of funds from the cohesion fund, right now from the just transition fund and the European Regional Development Fund, the ERDF. Also, to this, we add the EU Recovery and Resilience Facility, obviously. Uh, these funds, however, are not nearly enough to enable authorities to fulfill their role into making mobility more sustainable. In the case of Romania, uh, the central government is slow, local governments are faster, smarter, especially in some areas of the country, okay? So uh, in this, ambient, basically, we support the proposal to extend funding from the budget for the Connecting Europe facility, the CEF, for trans-European transport network, networks, TNT that is, uh, in order to ensure the first and last mile solutions that includes uh, multimodal uh, hubs, park and ride facilities, safe active uh, infrastructure for walkers, for cyclists, and we have to stress that 10T funding should also be, uh, should also support public and collective transport infrastructure projects such as renovation of buses and, uh, you know, intermodality expanded altogether. Anyway, the thing is that the railways are at the core of all these developments. Um, expanding the 10T network will require also urban nodes to play a bigger role. These nodes currently receive only 1% of the CEF funding and need to be better defined so they can be eligible for co-financing, so more money into them. These nodes lead to urban, they are urban nodes basically and are part of a broader network of connections. So the supporting role nodes play in active mobility and public transport must be documented further and supported 
basically by everybody. Um, so local authorities uh, that represent urban, why am I telling you all this? It's really important because in Romania, I mean, we, we were in Bucharest, okay, it's a huge node. It, it went to, to Brasov or to Cluj and eventually to Oradea and Arad, which are in, say more or less important nodes, but it stopped in other places such as Kopshamika, for example, which is very, very small, right? It's a locality that has somewhere around 10,000 inhabitants and uh, Kurtic, which is also important because that's the, the crossing towards, uh, towards Hungary. And it was pretty much ignored, you know? So th this, is, this is crazy because you have this, uh, uh, you have this important um, small nodes, you know, along the 10T uh, route and basically nobody was really interested. Anyway, uh, finally, in the list of urban nodes, the 10T network should be extended during the planned revision right now. And uh, uh, that is because uh, the, the regulation from 2013 drastically limited the potential to mobilize funding, especially local fund. Now, probably the biggest issue in uh, Central and Eastern Europe is the missing links on the 10 network. So that's in particular at, uh, at the cross-border sections. I already mentioned Kurtic, Kurtic Lökös Haza, uh, Romania and Hungary, right? But it's valid for many others uh, along Central and Eastern Europe. So these can delay uh, the completion of 10 uh, The implementation of cross-border infrastructure projects and feeder lines should be spent uh, uh, should, sorry, should be sped up so that they generate uh, intended and more added value. Investments also in interoperable rail infrastructure have to be crucial in Central and Eastern Europe in order to ensure uh, faster, normal cross-border traffic in the end. Okay, this is valid for the West as well. I mean, the biggest bottleneck, for example, is in Brennero between Austria and uh, Italy. Uh, there are in the West is not uh, all rosy, but in in Central and Eastern Europe, there's a bit of a problem at every crossing. Uh, now, for rail, the Connecting Europe facility is the key financing instrument. I'm saying it again, but I'm going to repeat it obsessively uh, for bridging the missing links, uh, the, for removing bottlenecks, and for improving harmonization and interoperability on the TNT core network. So. It will increase competitiveness, market share in the European rail system and local development all along that um, you know, core. Um, the funds are also needed to complete the 10 network or extend it when uh, it's justified by market needs. So it, it, it's including uh, the finalization of uh, major ongoing 10 projects, such as Brasov CBU in Romania, in our case, which is diesel, but now it's gonna get electrified fast, hopefully. Then the support for digital transformation of rail operations. Uh, that's pretty much it that we're interested in in our project. Uh, also, a very important point, I guess, is the final. It's the resilience and recovery facility. It's, it's the biggest hype in Europe right now. In Romania, it's like a national obsession. Uh, it's the most important probably at this point, financial instrument that can help uh, the railways deliver and ensure the core and comprehensive networks. Uh, it is also important to include important missing infrastructure routes and cross-border connections based on a case-by-case -case analysis in the 10 core network. That's Jeff Ere and our ministry have to work a lot together with us, hopefully, you know, to, to sort it out. Again, the focus should be made on last mile connections in urban areas, proper and interoperable rail connections with neighboring and third countries is also a very extremely important uh, issue. Uh, before we started this, I mean, when we were preparing this uh, workshop, we were talking with uh, John and with Vukash if we should include the Balkans and uh, say Eastern Europe, like Ukraine in this, uh, Ukraine and Moldova, okay. Um, we decided not to, but uh, let me just mention that uh, neighboring third countries like in the Balkans uh, and Eastern Europe uh, sh should be fostered, uh, you know, in, in, in being supported with the development of infrastructure in order to have passenger traffic as, as smooth as possible. 
the TNT policy must be extended though, uh, thus to, to the Balkans. It is very important because if you take Western Balkans, Serbia is a very important node. Belgrade is a very important node. Uh, basically, <laughs> it's Orient Express or whatever you want to call it uh, in a nicer manner, but that, that's, that's the way it passes. It, it's, it, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, it's just mere geography. So in general, funding for rail infrastructure development should become more predictable uh, uh, in order to reduce and better align uh, temporary capacity restrictions, you know, in order to have a better capacity use. Uh, in Romania, for example, we have a lot of problems in knowing uh, and having access to data related to passengers and to emissions and so on and so forth. Finally, the Community of European Railway, the CER, actually it's called the Community of European Railway and Infrastructure Companies, to which CFRA is a member of, um, recently issued a communique in which it calls the member, calls the, the member states that have not implemented such measures, as I mentioned before, uh, to provide a multi-annual financing to their infrastructure managers for maintenance and development of rail infrastructure. That is data, data, and a lot of information about it. So that's pretty much what I uh, wanted to tell you. It's a lot of money that can come in to all our countries. Uh, most of them are very, I mean, many of them are very successful with this, especially Poland. Uh, some of them are to the brink of the disaster and that's uh, that's Romania and I think Bulgaria as well but if we have a Bulgarian here later we can talk about it so thank you again and uh, I'm gonna give the word to John Worth and he's gonna tell us about um, night trains in Europe uh, hold on just a second I'm just hold on right save that Okay, um, I was just wanting, as you were just um, talking about the Connecting Europe Express, I've just done uh, finding some photos of my trip on the Connecting Europe Express. So I'll, I'll start with them, um, I'll start with that. So hold on a minute, let me just make sure. Oh, that's yeah, yeah. So, wait, no, that's wrong. Play slideshow in window. Then we're good if I then share my screen. Right, you should see a presentation there now as well, okay? All good? Yeah, right. So good morning, everyone. Um, and uh, thank you for taking the time for discussing this uh, very important issue uh, this morning. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about the Connecting Europe Express and uh, building on the points that have just been raised. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the Trends for Europe uh, campaign and what I'm trying to do with that, that campaign. Both of these issues are, are intrinsically linked because it was in my context of the Trends for Europe campaign that I went on the Connecting Europe Express in the first place. Um, uh, so I'll start, I'll start there and I'll start and then I'll go on to the campaign. You can download the slides, you see the link there and we can send those around later on um, or the materials uh, for, for this campaign. Um, it also must be said that since the last time I spoke to some of you in this round about the campaign, actually I've moved on organisationally speaking. I now have an organisation, an NGO in Berlin called Mit Ost that's helping me with the organisation of this campaign. So it's not just me as a kind of an alone campaigner anymore. Um, I actually have an organisational structure behind me uh, by now. But let's talk Connecting Europe Express. Um, so I, I took the train from Berlin to Krakow to get on the Connecting Europe Express. Um, took the Connecting Europe Express in Krakow, Ostrava, um, uh, then with a night train section through to Ljubljana in Slovenia, and then took the train back from Ljubljana via Villach, Linz and Prague uh, back to Berlin. So I saw a lot of different things in European railways um, over the course of the four day period uh, last week. That's a picture of the Connecting Europe Express um, arriving uh, in, um, uh, into Krakow. The most important point, I think, um, from seeing things from the Connecting Europe Express in terms of what you what you see with your own eyes, and that was why it was an interesting experience to be on the train, was they deliberately routed it along routes where the European Union is helping re rebuild infrastructure. So if you take the cross-border section, this is not the route 
which is normally um, uh, that the Euro City train would take from Krakow to Ostrava in Czech Republic, because it would normally go via Katowice. Um, instead, it goes via this town at the border. I'll post the name in the chat. I can't begin to pronounce that. Zebrzydowice, perhaps, something along those, those lines. Uh, anyway, um, the line between there and, um, um, and Krakow is currently being rebuilt with European Union money. So that's a picture taken out of the window of the Connecting Europe Express, showing that investment in that infrastructure. So that's good. Those people along that route will, thanks to the European Union, get better quality um, local connections and potentially cross-border connections as well. And it will speed up Ostrava to Krakow connections if they're routed that way. Why, however, did we have to change locomotive at the border yeah, on the Polish side? That is because the locomotive you see there um, uh, on the screen, the new locomotives from PKP into City, which are built by the Polish manufacturer Nevag, uh, have so far not been approved to cross any borders. There are only single voltage locomotives. And even though the voltage is the same on the Czech side of that border, still three kilovolts DC, they haven't managed to get their locomotives approved. So here is the first kind of contradiction which you have right in the middle of everything that's being done with the Connecting Europe Express. On one hand, you have the trade associations in Brussels saying, Europe needs to sort out its, in its interoperability issues. We need more money. We need compatible electrification systems, signaling systems, and so on. And then a member organization of the very same association is itself not getting its new locomotives approved just to even cross the border just a few kilometers into Czech Republic. So as you could change the locomotive in, in Bohumin on the Czech side, which is where more typically it's done. And indeed, with locomotives dating from the 1980s, that works. But this locomotive built by Nevag last year, it dates from 2020, that locomotive, such a cross border thing to even just literally a few kilometers across the border. Uh, doesn't uh, doesn't work. So there's some hypocrisy a bit there in terms of the way the whole Connecting Europe Express um, was set up. I haven't got a slide of it here as well, but I was actually, before going on the Connecting Europe Express, I was speaking at a conference with the boss of um, the Community of European Railways about this express. And I was in Brussels, having traveled to Brussels by train to speak at the event. And the boss of Community of European Railways was at Vienna Airport, flying from Vienna to Brussels, despite the fact that a member organization of Community of European Railways, Austrian Railways, OBB, runs a night train between Vienna and Brussels. Right now, so there is an enormous amount of hypocrisy in this, also with regard to the, the situation with the, the Transport Commissioner, Dina Valian, speaking in, um, uh, in Bucharest. Of course, she didn't take the train from Brussels to Bucharest, despite the fact that us railway nerds on Twitter, we planned her a nice route and even told her how to book the tickets if she wanted to, um, uh, to take the train 35 hours from, um, from Brussels to Bucharest. So within this, there's this kind of bundle of contradictions. So at one level, the Connecting Europe Express is a really nice and interesting thing to get talking to different people about railways. But on the other side, there are certain kind of hypocrisies inherent in this thing, which, which, which made me feel very nervous. Um, here are a few other bits and pieces. Oh, wait, I, I hadn't animated that one correctly. Um, the poles were very hypocritical as well, not just with the locomotive. They connected up two extra carriages to the Connecting Europe Express in Poland. But though, those were, were carriages that were only set, um, allowed to travel on Polish tracks, which was not very European. Um, in Krakow Station, you had a bunch of kind of self-congratulatory speeches by local politicians and PKP saying how great what they were doing was. And we had the same in Ljubljana. Um, I haven't actually, I did, couldn't actually go to the actual conference, but they put this big tent and a band and a kind of great meeting, the Connecting Europe Express. But the slogan was hop on European Year of Rail, but no normal person could even travel on this train. Um, and I only managed to participate because a friend of mine in Brussels leaked me the link to enable me to participate and go on the train. And then having found out how to do it, they probably there was no way they could realistically say no. So the whole experience is really weird. I traveled right across Europe, a whole chunk of Europe for free on an incredibly beautiful and well looked after train with a first class panorama carriage and a nice night train carriage and so on for free. Yeah. And there were 20 people on a six on a six carriage train, like the whole thing feels really off. Yeah? All of the carriages on this Connecting Europe Express, the newest one dates from the late 1980s, Yeah, because the old technology is is interoperable. Uh, but the new technology that the railways are buying is not right. So the whole process feels really, really strange. Um, now, 
in all of this, what did work was political lobbying. So hitting the train for hours, yeah, talking to commission officials who were in that train gave me more time to make my case about the night train things and trains for Europe otherwise would ever have had. So for the purposes of lobbying and campaigning, it was really useful. For the purposes of improving European rail, I'm not so convinced. Right? Anyway, let's move on to um, trains for Europe. Um, and and what, am I, what am I trying to do? So the, I'm a EU politics nerd and communications consultant by background. I'm not a railway person. Um, I'm a sustainable transport person by political conviction. And because my work has taken me Europe wide over all of these years, and I travel by train all the time to it, 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 crazy distances, right? I've been to Belgrade by train this year. I've taken work trips by train from Berlin to both Cluj and Yash in Romania in, uh, in, in 2019. I regularly travel to Brussels by train and things go wrong. When you see that, you kind of, you get angry. And when you get angry, you want to try to step in and, and improve matters and improve the, um, um, the, improve the, 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 the situation. So during lockdown, and because as a British citizen, I'm bored of talking about Brexit and I wanted to work on something else, I tried to work out what campaigning activity was worthwhile building in railways. And hit upon the idea of trying to solve the night train rolling stock problem, which is what Trains for Europe is initially trying to, trying to fix. Now, I'm not alone in this. I've got an organization, MITOS, that's backing me. And I've got some reasonable political backing already from some members of the European Parliament, from a former European Commissioner for Transport, Violetta Bult, and a number, so particularly among kind of green leaning politicians, at least some support for, for this idea. Now, what's the crux of the problem? European railway companies in the 1990s and early 2000s cut back their long distance nighttime services at the time when cheap flights were gaining traction. It was considered that night trains were passé, people would not take them, they were not necessarily profitable, and no one invested in order to manage to improve the service. Now that's pretty much universally the, the case in both Western European countries like France or Central and Eastern European countries like Poland, for example, which has invested heavily in some of its daytime trains, but has not invested much uh, in, in its provision of, of night trains. So it was, an, uh, it was perhaps an understandable decision then, right? Now, two things have subsequently changed. Um, climate change has risen up the agenda uh, and the debate about decarboning tra decarbonizing transport has become increasingly important. And liberalization of railways has made the European Union think, hang on a minute, there are some com companies that might potentially want to step in in order to man manage to run night trains. There is only one company, however, that is the kind of the big exception in all of this that's actually trying to solve the night trains problem in Europe just now. It is Austrians, Austria's state-owned railway, an UBB, um, that has received lots of publicity for its investment in new night train rolling stock. It's buying 30 new night jet trains, the first of which will be running on Europe's tracks um, from December of next year, if all goes to plan. The problem, however, is Austrian Railways wants to run routes which start or end in Austria and potentially in Switzerland and in southern Germany because collaboration, particularly with Swiss Railways, is good, but they have no intention of running any other connections. I've heard it said on the record by the OBB's head of passenger transport, Kurt Bauer, we are sure there is a market for a Cologne to Warsaw night train, but we, OBB, will not run it because we're an Austrian railway company, right? So basically, if your route is to or from Austria, all is cool or comparatively cool and you can live with that. If you're somewhere else and you're, you need to improve some other route, then the Austrians are probably not necessarily going to solve it for you. We then have this problem. The companies that would have the financial means to procure a new night train rolling stock have no intention of doing so, right? So that's Deutsche Bahn, SNCF, PKP, Train Italia, Renfe, uh, potentially even Marv or Chesky, Chesky Drahi. Um, and the companies that would be all too happy to run night trains are too small to actually buy the trains that they would need. So you have the situation where the, the Czech provider, um, uh, RegioJet, for example, is trying to buy up or lease whichever secondhand night train cars it can possibly find anywhere on the leasing market, however old they are, 
or however in poor condition that they are, right? There are simply no Liegewagen couchette cars or particularly sleeping cars, Schlafwagen, anywhere really to be found, right? Now, there might be a few in, in France or in Romania that are, would be in potentially a renovatable state, but those national railway companies are not willing to really give those over to, uh, to anyone else. So that's the crux of the problem. Basically, those people that could solve this problem don't want to, and the people that want to can't, right? And so that's the essence of what I'm trying to basically solve. I am not, importantly, with Trains for Europe, trying to make the argument of why night trains are a good thing. That is for plenty of other people to do. My campaign is basically to say, if you want to scale up night trains, how do you do it? So could the EU stop, step in to solve this problem, right? Um, there are ways that the European Union could solve this problem if it wanted to, right? And these are how ways that the European Union could solve this problem. There are essentially three ways that the European Union could solve the problem. The first is you take the example of freight, uh, the market for freight railways for uh, both locomotives and wagons. So this is what I call the full service ownership leasing model. So if tomorrow you wanted to run a container train from Bucharest to Rotterdam, you could do that as a company comparatively easily. You can lease container wagons and an interoperable locomotive capable of the speeds and interoperability that you would need on the leasing market. There are different companies that would happily lease you both wagons and locomotives for such a connection, right? Railpool, MRCE, Beacon Rail, and a bunch of others, right? If you tomorrow wanted to run a night train from Bucharest to Amsterdam, there are simply no carriages that you can get on the leasing market in order to manage to provide that service. A locomotive you can just about get because you can redeploy a freight locomotive, but the carriages you can't get. So how do you manage to tempt the leasing companies into this market to make an order for night train rolling stock that they could then lease to whichever company wanted to operate such a night train? Now, I, in Trains for Europe, am neutral. I don't care if it's Regiojet or CFR or MAV or PKP or take your pick of who would run these trains, but none of them can at the moment because they haven't actually got any trains that they could literally run. So what would happen here is the leasing company would purchase and maintain the stock and would then lease that to operators when the operators needed it. And you would probably use loans from the European Investment Bank and some state guarantees to make sure that the rolling stock leasing companies didn't make a loss. So that's where I'm working at the moment to try to put all of these pieces together to basically say, hey, rolling stock leasing companies, would you make an order for this stock if you could manage to make sure you were guaranteed against any potential losses? The second route you can potentially do it draws heavily on the examples of um, rolling stock leasing systems in Sweden and Norway and in the German region Baden-Württemberg. So what happens here is you have a publicly owned rolling stock pool. So if you take the example of Baden-Württemberg, they realized that, that basically only Deutsche Bahn would offer them regional trains, um, or train services, unless they actually completely change the model for train procurement. So what happens in Baden-Württemberg is the regional government buys the trains through a state-owned rolling stock pool, and it then leases those to the operators, which are actually mostly private companies, and actually indeed some are Deutsche Bahn. Yeah? So you could do the same in the European Union. The European Union would buy and procure the trains, and then lease those to whichever railway company wanted to operate them. Now, this would be more appealing than the route via rolling stock leasing companies that I mentioned in the previous slide, but it's more legally difficult to do. You would probably need a new European, European law in order to manage to do something like this. So it's comparatively operationally harder to do, but it's still on the table as a route or as an option. And the third is you find some route instead, um, the EU would buy the rolling stock. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, um, but that's the question, the question is, is should the, should the European Union do such a thing, right? Now, the, the European Commission tells me the EU does not itself want to buy rolling stock. The EU does not hold big assets like that, right? So do it some other way, 
all right? Politicians on the left tell me, hang on a minute, should the EU be basically financing an acquisition of private operators in the rolling stock leasing market, Railpool, MRCE, uh, Beacon, and all of the different le leasing companies? Well, they've also kind of got a point, but at the moment, I'm neutral between those two, yeah? It depends if you're more of an economic liberal or you're more on the left, ideologically speaking, of which is the better bet, right? Um, and I'm in my campaign, I'm neutral between those options. Well, there's a third option, which is a bit more complicated to work out how it works, because it's an option which was done only in one German region so far. It's the partnership between Nordrhein-Westfalen and Siemens for the procurement of regional trains, the so-called rhine ruhr Express trains, whilst the maintenance of the trains was conducted by the manufacturer. So you had the manufacturer paying a much greater longer term role in the procurement of the of the rolling stock now there's only one partial example for that so i don't really that one's the least researched of the different options right so those are the ways and means the european union could potentially solve this problem full service leasing model with private sector leasing companies a state-owned rolling stock pool or some kind of an arrangement with the 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 manufacturers along the lines of the way that, that the rhine ruhr express system works there's already some political support for this. So um, the, the now outgoing German transport minister, Andreas Scheuer, has mentioned that uh, rolling stock, particularly for night trains, is a problem when he held a summit of transport ministers in May of this year. Um, the transport, the conclusions of the Transport Council during Portugal's presidency of the EU in June of this year mentioned that the rolling stock problem would need to be solved if, if long distance cross-border trains needed to be scaled up. And MEPs proposed amendments to the smart mobility strategy in June 2021, saying the night train rolling stock problem needed to be solved. So essentially, there is an understanding that this problem does need to be fixed. There's not yet an understanding of exactly the way and means of how to do it. So what are we doing about that? So Trains for Europe, which I started publicly in June of this year, so it's not been going very long so far. So the campaign is in its early stages. We're scaling up this autumn. I am in this campaign studiously operator neutral. I don't care at the moment in the campaign which type of company it is that runs these night trains. Um, we need to make sure, however, that someone does. Um, and it's also very important, though it doesn't say on the slide, I'm also proposing in the way the rolling stock pool would work, what I kind of call a minimum viable night train. It essentially, I have the very strong steer from different players across the railway sector that the easiest and quickest train to build and to get approved in as, for as many routes as possible is a 200 kilometer an hour maximum speed locomotive hauled set of seven carriages go above 200 kmh or have multi-gauge trains or have distributed traction yeah so the motors are spread across the train right like a style like a german ice um, and you end up having a difficulty in managing to get your train approved for as many countries as possible haul it with a locomotive and you either have an interoperable freight locomotive hauling your train or if you really need to you can still do it old style and change the locomotive at the border Please bear in mind that this issue that I'm dealing with here with night train rolling stock does not solve all of the many problems that we have with cross-border rail. It might not even legitimately be the biggest problem that we need to solve with cross-border rail, but in the provision of night trains, it is the first problem that you have to solve because simply you can't scale up night trains because no one's got any night trains, right? Later on, there are other issues with regard to, tra to track access, access to stations, ticketing, open data, and a bunch of other issues. Conversely, when we come to cross-border rail in the daytime, be that long distance or regional rail, the problems are much more difficult to break that, or sorry, that's wrong. The problems are much more varied. At some borders, the infrastructure is missing. At some borders, the rolling stock is missing. In some borders, the ticketing is missing. And sometimes it's a combination of all of those, all right? So basically, I can't as easily make a finite, concrete political goal for cross-border rail in general as I can for night trains. In night trains, I know what the first domino is that has to fall. Someone's got to order some new trains, right? 
When we talk about cross-border rail in general, then it's much more complicated. The question starts, which border are you talking about, right? Which makes formulating a campaign about that much more, much more difficult. But that's also then the reason why the campaign is called Trains for Europe, not Night Trains for Europe, is because if this one were to be a success, then potentially I might move on to try to solve other problems um, in, um, in, in, in uh, cross-border rail um, Europe-wide. So uh, that is all from me uh, introducing, the, introducing the project. Um, and uh, now I'm open to your kind of thoughts, questions, uh, remarks. I'm also very happy to answer country-specific questions from everyone listening in here. If you want to know how this would apply to routes to or from wherever you are or wherever your interest is, very happy to, uh, to go into details of individual or national connections as well. Thank you so much, John. That was, that was really, really, really amazing. Uh, I, I can start with the first question because, I mean, it's the question that puzzled me from the first time I heard you actually. Uh, and that is the, the fact that the EU would buy rolling stock. To, to, I, I simply cannot understand how this can be done because the EU doesn't even own the, e, the buildings of the EU institutions. EU does not, I mean, okay, it, it can be a big change. Of course, we can open our minds to that, you know, but it's like customary kind of for the EU not to own assets altogether. Yeah, yes. Um, and... So Baden-Württemberg didn't own rolling stock either a decade ago, right? Um, it, it had to, you have to cross unusual bridges if you've made yourself an unusual problem in your, in your provision of cross-border railways. You know? um, and I honestly think, right, that the EU buying this stock outright is politically a bridge too far, right? Genuinely, I think it's a bridge too far. But I have to keep it in as an option in the Trains for Europe campaign because there is a legitimate ethical reason why it might make sense. Now, it strikes me based on the path of least resistance that I have discovered so far, that my route one going via privately owned leasing companies is the route of least resistance. That does not make it the ethically most correct outcome, right? Now, what I'm doing is systematically working through all of those problems to basically be able to, ideally by the end of this year, but probably it's gonna slip into the beginning of 2022, is be able to have a workable plan that essentially says, EU, if you wanted to own the rolling stock, this is how you do it. Or EU, if you wanted to support the private sector to procure these trains, this is how you do it. Yeah. Um, so at the moment, I agree with the kind of your worry implicit in that question, but I am not completely definitively opposed to it yet. So I see there's a question, what about public service obligations? Right, so this is a mess. So if, if you've followed the, the, the situation with regard to the procurement of um, the Swedish trying to do a public service obligations procurement of two international night trains, Stockholm to Hamburg and Malmö to Cologne and Brussels. Right now, they only managed to get it to work for Stockholm to Hamburg, and they didn't find an operator to run their PSO obligation night train through to Brussels. Now, one of the reasons that didn't work was because no one had any rolling stock, right? So that's also part of the reason why it didn't function. But the second reason it didn't work is because different European countries have a completely different point of view with regard to public service obligations. So Sweden and Denmark say we are fine with public service obligation contracts for long distance cross-border rail. Germany says, no, we're not, right? So there is no legal way to do that for long distance services. For regional services, you can do it in Germany. So if it crosses the border into only one land in Germany, PSO obligations are possible. So that's how, for example, uh, a Chechen to Berlin is, is, is organized. It's done with the land or the, 
the lender of Berlin and Brandenburg. It's not done with the German federal government. So if you want to run a, um, a train just into Germany, you can manage to do it. If you want to run, run right across Germany, then you can't. Now, overall, the EU at the moment is kind of stuck here between some countries that want a PSO-based model and other countries that want a open access model with a reduction of track access charges to make the track access charges low enough to mean that those services could be run on a profit-making basis. And it's also really interesting that despite Denmark and Sweden having PSO models, the only night train internationally that runs southbound from Sweden is an open access train, Snell targets night train, which, which runs from Stockholm to Berlin, which is an open access train, not a PSO train. So this is overall a complete mess. Now, I at the moment in Trains for Europe do not want to take a position on PSOs because I find that this PSO is like a big issue. It's like a hot potato, which gets passed around. Those people that like PSOs blame the countries that don't have PSOs. Those countries that don't have PSOs blame those that do. And everyone says, oh, it's always the problem of what's happening on the other side of the border. While other companies like Snell Torget or like RegioJet have just gone on with it and said, if there's a market for night trains, we're just going to do it anyway. And so basically, I'm therefore more interested medium term in the issue of track access charges and access to pass than I am necessarily than about trying to get some kind of EU public service obligations system set up. I just find that there are too many very entrenched national positions in that, which make it very, very hard to do. Um, so yeah, it's a headache, but I don't have a ready solution for that one. Let me answer that question with regard to the TEE proposal. So Germany's transport minister, um, um, Scheuer, about the only really good thing that he's put forward is what's called Deutschland Tact, which is a systematic reorganization of Germany's national railway timetable to make it more similar to the Swiss system, where you're basic, base it on a standard timetable each hour and where trains are timetabled to cross so as to make sure you have short connecting times in important stations. That requires certain infrastructure um, upgrades, but essentially Deutschland Tact in terms of, from the passenger perspective is generally speaking a good thing. The problem is, is his initial plans were heavily national. And so what he then did is asked his officials in the ministry to Europeanize his plans. And those plans were then called TE 2.0, which was basically adding international trains, both daytime trains and nighttime trains as kind of additions to Germany's national Deutschland tact plans. Now I've spent a lot of time talking to the German ministry and talking to the consultants that wrote the, wrote the proposal on TEE 2.0 for the German government, and it is not a plan. It is a, we want to show what is possible idea, but for example, there is no passenger demand statistics, for example, which have gone into the plan. There is no, how operationally viable are these trains which have gone into a plan? They've basically taken what trains, <laughs> sorry, what trains used to exist in, on European long distance routes and try to integrate them with Germany's plans for Deutschland tact. It's nothing more than that. So it's handy as a way of starting a debate, but it is no way a workable plan, right? The models I'm working on, on passenger demand, and I've been doing a lot of research on that behind the scenes, are already more developed than was the case in Scheuer's TEE 2.0. So it's not, the TE 2.0 is not wrong, but it's not actually workable either. Yeah. Um, so use it if it's helpful, but it's not going to happen, and it's not going to happen in that form. Uh, uh, ah, okay, so you don't want to speak anymore, right? Mm -hmm. I would just John uh, answered my questions. I mean uh, the 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 in-depth questions before I started to speak. Thank you, thank you, John. It was very good. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Uh, do you think night trains? I mean, do do you have any data or have you researched on um, on uh, say? Um, air to rail sort of uh, emissions um, 
aspect of the whole thing. So using a night train, uh, John, is it is it emitting way more than flying? No, so, right, it's tricky. So how green is a night train? Um, as trains go, it's medium, right? So night trains have the problem that your capacity per a number of passengers per ton of metal that you have to transport around yeah, is not as good as the daytime train, right? You can put 80 seats easily in a daytime train carriage. You can put 60 beds in a couchette, 35, 40 beds in a, a sleeping car. But you run it up to 200 kilometers an hour and your electricity that you use is not exorbitantly high, right? High speed trains are in terms of the electricity that you use are actually worse because the more you speed up your train, the more your drag increases and the more electricity you need to power it, right? So overall, your best bet is an electric powered medium speed train. Your second best is a electric powered medium speed night train. And your worst environmental performance is in terms of electricity used is a, a high speed train. But then comes the second question, how do you generate your electricity, right? So railway companies, notably OBB, because they're good at this stuff, and the Swiss railways are making sure that they are using only renewable sources for their, uh, for their electricity. Germany is getting closer to doing that. France, uh, SNCF buys most of its electricity from nuclear power, right? Make your mind of whether you think that's a good or a bad thing, but at least it's carbon neutral. Um, so essentially, then you might have this, the case, right? For example, I don't know what the energy mix is that PKP in Poland uses. I imagine it's a large percentage of coal, right? So then you've got potentially a difficulty there. You've then also got the issue, which, which we would touch upon with the Connecting Europe Express is, how much environmental benefit is there actually of a diesel powered night train, right? So there are certain connections. So Rusa to Bucharest, Belgrade to Dimitrovgrad on the route to Sofia, um, the evening Norway, for example, Trondheim to Bordeaux, which is a regularly used night train route, only runs on diesel. Um, there might be some problems still. Um, Dresden, Görlitz, through to Wrocław in Poland, for example, um, where you might still need diesel power. Yeah, in the earlier years, if you're trying to connect up anything in the Baltic states before they've completed Rail Baltica. So what you need to make sure you do is then when making out, make, working out where is the main market for night trains is to make sure that they're not powered by diesel because that's the worst environmental catastrophe of, of, of all. Also, you, you've got to make sure then what about where is their passenger demand, right? Now, this is harder to work out than you might think, right? Now, and at the moment, getting a, a solid Europe-wide statistical basis is quite difficult. So the best numbers, strangely, on passenger demand for night trains are for France, because the French Ministry of the Environment has done some brilliant piece of research on it, right? You can get really well worked out, very solidly based statistics for night trains in France, and also France to its neighboring countries. Getting an equivalent statistical basis for Germany, for example, is really, really difficult. And so how do you work out what is your potential demand? Now, you've got to put in tons of different factors into this. One is how many passengers are literally traveling between those two cities. Yeah. The second is what other alternatives have they got, right? Like, are there other rail alternatives, daytime trains, night um, uh, planes, cars, ca um, carpooling, buses, I don't know what. The third is would people even trust the train, right? So in Austria, and this is very little research, right? There's a very interesting question I'm kind of fascinated by in, in, um, uh, that the commissioners asked. Ask a population, what percentage of a population took a train in the last year, right? Now, that might sound like a weird question, but it basically says a person thinks a train might be an option, right? Like and in Austria, the percentage is something like 96% of the population took a train at least once in the last year. In Croatia, which is the lowest in the EU, it's 30%, right? 
And like, for example, the Baltic states is also incredibly low. It's under 50%, right? Now, so would you, as I don't know, a business traveler, consider the train as an option? Now, if you're traveling in Austria or indeed Austria to its neighboring countries, you probably would, right? But if you're a business traveler in Croatia, you probably wouldn't. So how much of a kind of mental hurdle is there to, to, manage, to, to manage to get over? What about other factors? So one of the things that railway companies have never really looked at, but clearly is actually a factor, is what about diaspora, right? So if you've got a big population that are living somewhere else, yeah, will they take the train to go home? Because they need to transport a lot of things, right? That's why there, I think that there is still a Zagreb, Ljubljana, Zurich train, right? Because there are a lot of people from the countries of the former Yugoslavia who work in Switzerland, right? Diaspora make up an enormous amount of the trains that cross from Moscow to the countries of Central Europe, of, of, of Central Asia, right? To Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, right? Where are the diaspora flows? There are a lot of Poles that work in the Ruhrgebiet in Germany, right? Is that a market? So I'm trying with this research, I've had a student who's been helping me and I'm also working with the University of Delft in the Netherlands to basically make a model that says, okay, what's the potential demand for night trains on different, on different routes? And last but not least, what about trip time, All right? Now, we know quite something about the motivation of passengers, right? And it works on a two, four, six rule. Two hour daytime train, train completes, competes with the car and should have a solid market, market share, particularly if the train is faster than the car, right? Four hours, that's when train is competing with both car and plane, but train can still gain a solid market share. So if you look at the gain in market share on the Berlin Munich route in Germany, when they reduce the trip time from six hours to four hours on that route, that massively increased rails market share over and above the plane, which had been the dominant mode on that route um, until then. And then by when the time you've got to six hours, your train is struggling for its market share. There is only one night train I've yet found in Europe that is profitable, you know, a night train that is profitable, where the daytime train has a trip time of less than six hours. That is the Malmö to Stockholm night train, yeah, which runs on a profit-making basis. Right? So every other profitable night train runs on a route that has a daytime trip time on the train of over six hours. Right? But what's the ideal upper limit? Now, what I'm trying to search for is routes which are based mostly on a night train trip time of 363. That means three hours from nine until midnight where you collect the passengers, six hours from midnight until 6 a.m. where basically the train either runs straight through or you basically don't count on picking up anyone, and then 6 a.m. till 9 a.m. is when you drop off the passengers, right? Basically meaning that you could have a proper full day in your destination after the arrival of the train, right? So your morning drop-off period for a night train is really important. If the train arrives too late, you basically cut off both all the business passengers, if they, those are even possible on a night train, and even some of your tourist passengers. Only the really kind of summer seasonal trips, like for, for example, to Split or something like that, are really ones where you can countenance having um, an arrival more or less after 9 a.m. So that's the kind of model that I'm working on. And so therefore I'm trying to find combinations, not of city pairs, but of groups of cities where you've got the 363 model works. Or if you've got massive demand, like for example, Vienna to the Ruhrgebiet in Germany, there you could even foresee two night trains. You do an early one departing from Vienna, which picks up in Linz and Salzburg and even Munich, then runs through and gets early in the morning at 6 a.m. in Cologne. And you then do a late one, which leaves Vienna at 11, gets to Frankfurt at 6 a.m., then drops people in Wiesbaden, Mainz, Koblenz and Bonn and ends up in Cologne, right? And gets to Cologne at nine, right? Now, 
that model, right, could also work, right, to have two trains on the route staggered in timing terms in a different way, so as to mean different interim cities could also potentially be covered. Um, so that's broadly speaking as the, the rough models I'm working on at the moment. Awesome. Um, can I ask, well, okay. I, I think it's maybe important to uh, mention something. There's uh, at the European Union level, there's a lot of talk about shift to rail, shift to rail, you know. So um, for those of you who don't know, it's about shifting passengers from uh, air transport to uh, to rail. So I think it's an aspect that we need to take into consideration. And I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's very important at the moment because um, not, a lot of, not a lot of you might know, but um, uh, there in 1997, basically we started heavily subsidizing the aviation industry even in, on, on short haul uh, flights. So um, um, there isn't a level playing field. And when we talk about, you know, um, this, this uh, shift getting more passengers on, on trains in Europe, it is very important, especially on, uh, um, you know, international, um, maybe international flights uh, that are not so um, um, far apart from each other, that they're also covered from, uh, um, you know, a, a, a rail um, perspective. Um, but the fact that, and, and I want to keep it very simple here, the fact that you can buy a return ticket to Brussels with 30 euros on, an, uh, on a plane does, yes. Yeah, I've been looking at, I've been, you know, uh, so all of these, uh, all, all, all of these, uh, you know, like low cost companies, have been heavily subsidized in Europe by everyone, basically. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. So, so, so of course I agree with all of that, right? Uh, totally, right? You're correct. But from my own point of view of what I'm trying to campaign here, I can't fix that one, right? Now, I, I have to. There are two ways of looking at it, right? One is rail versus other modes, which is essentially what you've just been talking about, and I agree. The other is, what can rail in and of its own terms do to be better? And I'm trying to basically answer that one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, there are two problems. I, yeah. I was just trying to make people yeah, yeah. So, uh, aware of the fact that we also have this problem. So there's the intrinsic problem of, you know, getting, get, getting rail um, to work better right. <laughs> across borders and there's this other problem of leveling the playing field yeah right totally and i i agree totally and i i'm 100 with you but i am relentlessly fo focusing on making rail itself better right now that might mean there are certain problems i can't solve here yeah there might be some routes where you go sorry we just can't get the price point for a, a train down low enough to mean it will work, right? That we just can't shift people to rail on that given route, right? But there are others where you can, right? I, I hate this argument in Germany. Ah, trains are too expensive on Berlin to Munich. Yeah, the plane will always win because it's cheaper. It's not cheaper, actually, right? If you book six weeks out, right? Or eight weeks or even four weeks, or even actually at the last minute, the train is consistently cheaper. <laughs> What people are doing in their, re in their thinking is comparing how they book a plane normally four or six weeks ahead with how they book a train normally. They go at the last minute, right? And if you don't compare like with like, then of course the train is more expensive, right? A last minute train versus a booked ahead plane is not a fair comparison, right? So I've tried it. I've gone through like how the booking intervals, right? Now, what would be handy to do would be to look at, and maybe I can put that in actually thinking about it in my research, is the routes where you can viably replace a plane with a train, yeah, to look at those price differentials on those routes. And that will also tie into what's happening in the German election, because there's been this argument about whether Germany should ban internal flights in Germany. Right now, 
I'm not of the view that Germany should ban internal flights because whether it's Germany or not is not the problem. What we all need to ban is really short flights, right? Whether they're in Germany or whether they're international, right? No one's talking about banning Frankfurt to Paris, but they are talking about banning Frankfurt to Berlin. And those by train are exactly the same time. They're four hours each, Frankfurt to Berlin and Frankfurt to Paris, right? So what? Sorry, John. And just and what I was saying is that you don't have to ban them on on short yeah. haul. You just have to uh, you you just have to you know introduce VAT and and yeah. everything else, so they pay their fair share, but, and and then passengers will also have to reconsider if. <laughs> totally right. So and but what you will find is on some connections actually already the train is economic, and on some others you won't. Right, and yeah. so. Um, and and, and a, a systematic, okay, these are the ones where there's really an imbalance for some reason, yeah? um, versus these are the ones where the train is actually comparatively okay already. Like that kind of, that kind of study would, would, would be useful. Yeah? Um, one further point. So the EU project called shift to rail. Yeah? So not shift to rail as a concept, but the EU project called that is having spent an hour talking to one of its project managers while on the Connecting Europe Express, is a very industry-focused and technical exercise. It is basically trying to overcome technical difficulties and problems in the railway industry, right? Now, that might sometimes be good or it might sometimes be bad, it, but it's heavily driven by the industry, right? So what they're financing about kind of a universal um, digit, uh, electronic coupler for freight wagons, for example, that in environmental terms looks like a really good thing that they're funding. But there'll be certain other things, which is kind of an obsession of the railway industry, which might not ultimately filter through to, to for gains for passengers. So if you encounter that project, the shift to rail project, just ask, just go into it with the idea that basically it's essentially driven and pushed by companies in the industry and so if you as activists have the same interests as an industry group has the project itself might be useful for you any further questions that was that was that was an excellent point um on the other hand, you, you, do you know that uh, now at EU level they're preparing to support really regional uh, airports again? So this this thing this thing is not going to stop. I did, this was the point that uh, Mihai made before, you know. So <coughs> the, is that that one gets better than the other? It's just that it's not level playing field. This is it. It's it's Mike Tyson fighting me. It's this is the thing that I'm learning from working on transport policy, right? Um, in Brussels, and perhaps even at the national level, certainly a bit in Germany, certainly a bit in the UK where I'm from, maybe I don't know of all of you from the different countries you're from, but being the transport minister or being in the European Parliament, an MEP that gets allocated to the transport committee or being the transport commissioner, right? Is a kind of what we call in German, a Torstpreis. It's like the kind of job you give away so the person you have to reward with something, but they didn't really want it. Uh, I, um, anyway, and, and so what you have, I find also from in the European Commission with Valian, for example, is I don't think she has any clear idea of what she really wants to do, right? So when she's talking to railway people, she'll say the nice things that sound nice for railways. When she's talking to airline people, she'll say what the nice things are for railways. Uh, for, for, for airlines, sorry. And she'll say the right things for cars, for the car people. But there is no real direction, right? There is also from the commission, no, even no kind of encouragement or no naming and shaming, right? Like when suddenly the, all of the France-Italy train connections all broke down because the operator Tello said, we can't operate in France anymore. Marseille to Milan, forget that, right? And it basically rendered the, the, the routes across that border basically impossible back, what, just before the summer, it was in May or something. Yeah, like. this year. This year, this year, yeah. And 
did the European Commission say anything? No, not at all, right? It didn't even say, this is a, this is a disappointing result, uh, we'll do what we can to make sure that it would be improved or whatever, like nothing, like dead silent. We or, don't expect that from Valen. You wouldn't get it from Valen, you wouldn't, right? No. And, and you wouldn't get it, right? And you wouldn't get it from her officials, right? So the commission is really, so really kind of uh, lacking in, in determination. And, and, and also what I've also learned from my, my conversations with the MEPs in the, in the transport committee, there's one, and he's my, my like kind of favorite go-to member of the European Parliament, it's the Swedish Green, Jakob de Lunde. It's a brilliant guy young, determined, and, and really knows rail, um, and, and really wants to get to the bottom of these problems. Now, I don't always agree with his solutions, but he's really good. And he realizes that he how to generate political momentum, and that, that that needs media work and communications, and you need to go on the spot, and you need to take photos, and you've got to, like, you've got to generate a kind of a momentum behind what you want. Whereas, Many, also many MEPs, even those whose heart is in the right place uh, to want to solve some of these problems, have no real fight, right? Or have no real, like, real commitment and determination to want to solve some of these problems. Right? And on the cross-border connections, right? Why is the Commission not going round each year and doing like a European cross-border rail index? which says, whatever, red is the tracks are missing, yellow is the tracks are okay, but uh, the trains don't run, green is uh, whatever, it actually runs, but okay. So and, and this year, Romania got worse because they canceled the, I don't know, the route from Timisoara to Versace, yeah? And France got better because it reopened the route from Mulhouse to Freiburg or whatever it is, right? And basically issue a kind of, I don't know, a league table of cross-border rail each year or something like that to basically say, hey, look, this is really bad in France, right? Why don't we fix this, yeah, right? Um, and so that type of that type of thing, right? Yeah, Wojciech's point is correct. I, I have raised it with German Watch actually as an option that German Watch should make an annual cross-border rail index. Um, but given there are 200 cross-border railway lines in Europe, it's quite a heavy piece of work to do. Um, but, um, but it does but like, sound like an NGO work. Indeed. Yeah, yeah, right. Like that type of thing would be great. Yeah. Um, so um, to basically then say, okay, you run a yearly, a yearly kind of state of play. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, keep that in mind. I, I I can't run that, not at the moment, um, but someone needs to do it. True. Um, any, we, actually, we were supposed to uh, voice our anger and, you know, get, get really cocky about what's happening in, in our region, about trains. Maybe Wukash, you wanted to say something about this? You know, strange situations on Eastern European rails. Uh, okay. Uh, do you have uh, my points from Poland, for example? Oh, yeah, yeah, I do. I do have them all. <laughs> I had a lot of fun with them. Okay, so maybe put uh, in, uh, in screen I... and I will tell something about the Poland and then we will discuss about the problem about uh, other countries. Well, it's true. So this is common for all Eastern European countries. I'm not going to share it or anything. I'm just going to read it. You say, hey, by bike is faster than by train. <laughs> this is not a joke. In some regions of Poland, like Silesia, in some connections, the average speed was 30 kilometers an hour. It was like that only a few years ago. So some people prefer to choose a bike and get some exercise instead. Yeah, it's true. Uh, actually, it, it was a big problem, especially in Silesia. It was uh, uh, eight, uh, nine, ten uh, to ten years ago. Now, it's of course, it's better, and we have a uh, average speed much, much more faster. But actually, it shows um, where why people decided to re, um, to, to to change train for another. Uh, transport so it, it 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 was a big problem not only silesia but mostly but of of, of course in other regions also 
this would this would be the Romanian um, uh, plight as well because uh, you, it, it, the unofficial number of average speed would be somewhere around 45 kilometers an hour you know which is ridiculous I'm sure the official one is somewhere it's over 60 but it's still ridiculously low so while comparing it to any other sort of uh, mode of transport it's, it's just like you understand why people would not take the train I would not take the train because you know, in especially regional ones, they're all diesel and they're so dirty. Basically they're dirty trains, uh, third hand bought from France, you know, they brought to Romania, you know, they are very slow, they are diesel and it's just ridiculous. I know they're called automotor in, in often, often times. And it's just like, uh, it just doesn't make any sense. Most especially if the, rail is electrified so it's an electric rail and they use diesel trains and it's, it's that's that's beyond ridiculous so uh, well at that point uh, you but, but france germany cross-border regional connections do that as well right your western european countries have exactly that stupidity too huh? strasbourg to offenburg or saarbrücken to forbach in france you have overhead wires and they run diesel trains mm -hmm. um so let me, let me pose you a question to those in the round here. On which of the borders from each of your countries are things improving or are getting worse in terms of the cross-border long distance rail? Right, for example, like Poland to Czech Republic, for example, it strikes me as the situation is not too bad. And with the prospect of it improving, how is, I don't know, the, the situation at the border of Romania, Hungary, for example, or terrible. Bulgaria? Usually, I mean, actually, to be honest, only it's only. But it has been improving. That's yeah. the thing. It's, it's no, no. In terms of time, it's not improved. I mean, you're waiting for one hour, really, maybe even more than one hour. It's it's absurd. But for the main they, reason that they changed the the engine there, you know, and it's just that why well, and they do passport controls on both sides still as well, right? Rather than just absolutely the yes, right. that it's also a Schengen issue. There you go. Well, because, for example, the Slovenians and the Croatians have sorted that out, right? So they now do all of the controls only in one station in Dobova. Um, okay. So therefore, at Hungary, Romania, for example, you could do all, theoretically, right? You could do all the controls at, at Kotica or Lukashaza. Um, like, you could find a way, but bearing in mind it's Hungary, you don't necessarily have the best political collaboration. Bearing in mind it's Romania, you won't have necessarily the best political No, no, no. Hungarian trains have improved, John. I mean, yes. when it comes to Hungary and trains, it, it's okay ish. I mean, their collaboration with ÖBB on one hand, because with, with Austria, everything works tip, work, is working tip top, you know, it's no problem, really. And yeah, also, the further south east to Slovakia east. and the Czech Republic from Hungary is quite all right. The further south and east you go in Hungary, it gets a bit ropey, though. The, the line that goes towards Zoradia and, and then onto Cluj uh, on the Hungarian side is quite slow. Uh, but yeah, any yeah. other further contributions here about the current situation, though? There are lots of people in the call who haven't contributed, said anything. Um, well, I guess we touched everything. Piotr, I don't know. Anyone? Um, uh, you know. About uh, the thing that Mihai say, said about this VAT, so about these differences uh, in competition between rail and aviation, would it make sense to report this to DigiComp and ask how they intend to remove this competitive imbalance like this VAT and etc.? Would it make sense for you? Oh, but this is what we're doing with TNE, Piotr, for the last 10 years. You know, but. <laughs> Kind of, you know, big push. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that at the Committee of the Regions, it was the Marshal of the um, Podkarpatia. Uh, yeah, Podkarpatia, yeah, one yeah. of the region, right. Okay, so he had a report very, very recently. It was about exactly this. And it was funny to see that uh, he was, you know, uh, super pro uh, regional airports, but I guess uh, that then I, I mean Zhezhov and stuff they're not well connected to the main rail lines. They are, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They are. So anyway, he wants you know cheap airports and cheap flights. <laughs> yeah, it's 
popular among amongst them. But... And it's also funny because you see all these right wingers that uh, suddenly become extreme socialists. You know, like that they want the state and the EU to help out in these issues. You know, it's a uh, it's a little bit staggering. Yeah, but I was thinking kind of you know big official regress to Digicomp. Mm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I had I had another I had another um, I don't know what you know about that I mean it's not about it's about Rail Baltica you know Rail Baltica basically in terms of <laughs> infrastructure no seriously John in terms of infrastructure from from the Polish side all the way to Kaunas in Lithuania is okay the infrastructure is done it's a hundred kmh yeah oh yeah, yeah. Oh, at this point yeah it's yeah, yeah. 160 wasn't it. No, it's 100 kmh at the moment, according to Open Railway Map anyway. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. But it's supposed to be 160. Yeah, it, it will be just about okay, yeah. Okay, the, the point is that they should be already operating. I mean, they were able to operate many, five years ago, you know. Yet, they, they don't do it. And uh, I, I to, to me, it's one... You know, the Baltic states are in the geopolitical big issue, right? Because they need to be connected to say i would say mainland but i don't know the core of europe so to say you know that, that would be that would be perfect that would be absolutely okay you know yet i by the way i'm there's only one train and it's the podlaski regional train that leaves um Białystok and gets to kaunas in like five hours yeah, yeah that's right. Every speed of like 40 kilometers an hour there was some criticism from the Lithuanian side that they want what they do not want high speed trains there for reasons related to biodiversity and conservation altogether. So just if you don't know the tool right I, I, I might it's such an I'm such an enormous fan of open railway map right so it's like it's a mashup of rail nerdiness and open street map it's a brilliant thing. Yeah, I, I... Um, um, so Warsaw to Bialystok is mostly 130 and 120. Bialystok to then north to Suwalki or something Suwalki. is then initially 80 and 100. And then the bit across the border to, towards Kaunas is then at the moment on the diesel line, some parts 80 and some parts 100. Well, that's terrible. Yeah, uh, so but I, it, it was a strange story, right? So I was, I was giving a lecture about railways in Belgrade and the, the presenter after me was about Rail Baltica, but they were presenting on Zoom and I was actually there in person. And I started looking at the situation with Rail Baltica and I find Rail Baltica a ridiculously messy program, right? Like this is, it makes, to me, really strong, geopolitical and transport sense right like it is the kind of if i were to say like one proper railway connection the eu really ought to do right it ought to be that right like it's really really significant but the project has been a fiasco from start to end right there's huge arguments about who would finance what which route will it take the fact it won't directly serve vilnius which the lithuanians are annoyed by but then we need to take it down a step, right, from our kind of environmental good is better than nothing perspective, yeah, right? There are literally no cross-border passenger trains at the moment between Lithuania and Latvia, despite the fact there are four cross-border lines, one of which has also got a speed of 120 kmh, right? Like, that's compatible, that's, like, in speed terms, right, it's competitive with a bus, right? Now, this drives me crazy. It's also the psychic case of France and Italy, where the cross-border connection is awful through the Alps, and they're building a new line, right? Yeah, it may be medium term you need a new line, but until you've got a new line, why are you not even making a basic use of the infrastructure that you've already got, right? We are not going to get Rail Baltica until 2028, right? <laughs> Are we basically saying forget any cross-border connections between Lithuania and Latvia until 2028, right? Mm -hmm. 
right? Even now, right? Because it's all broad gauge. Even now you could run a, a Tallinn, a Tallinn Vilnius night train. Yeah? I don't know whether it would be profitable. I haven't worked out the, the pattern on that, right? But run it broad gauge. Yeah? Um, yeah. And, and, and so these are, that's why you've got to, I think, to analyze these problems, you've got to break it down in three stages. Yeah? Infrastructure first is simply the, tra the tracks missing, or are they too slow, or is there any, a, a compatibility problem or something like that, right? The infrastructure problem first and foremost, and try and fix it, but also try and fix it in a way which, where you can get some short-term gains and you have the, right, yeah, <laughs> that's the cross-border DMU that goes to count us, right? The, yeah. the, the cross, solve the cross-border infrastructure issues but get the ones fixed, which are quick to fix, right? Mons in Belgium to Valenciennes in France, there is two kilometers of track missing, right? Like fix that, right? Like benefit the people who, who, who live at that, at that border. So first level is, does the infrastructure exist or not and fix it? The second is, do the trains run? And if they don't run, how are you potentially gonna fix it, right? Now, I don't know for Lithuania Latvia connections, right? If the state railways won't fix it, then is there an opportunity for a private railway to potentially fix it? I don't know, maybe, but I, I imagine that there's no private railway that has any broad gauge rolling stock we could potentially use. Um, and, and, so, and then the third stage is, is if the trains then exist, but like how do you then actually make sure that you maximize the numbers of people using them? Now, this one is the one which I'm confronted with very often by non-railway people they're like you mean a train runs and no one takes it it's like yeah that happens quite often because like there are situations at many borders france germany being the one i have most often where just actually literally getting a ticket for your cross-border train is such a pain that no one would that no one would want to take it or when i was in slovenia last week you can buy e-tickets for all trains in slovenia but not for Slovenian cross-border connections. So if you want to go from, as I needed to go from Ljubljana to Villach in Austria, you'd have to still go to the railway station in order to buy it. So those are the three levels and, and we need a rigorous determined effort to assess it of the problems at each border uh, according to those three levels um, or, or which combination of the three that it is. Well, right. maybe. I think I will probably, if, unless there's more questions for me, I think I should probably log off. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, and thanks for letting me present here. Um, what one final point from my side is I'm, after having learned the lesson of the Connecting Europe Express, I am myself trying to organize a kind of Trains for Europe Express. <laughs> like not literally a train, but it, it's basically going to be me probably traveling for a week and in each stop visiting activists to talk about trains for Europe and to try to do the types of conversations that the Connecting Europe Express should have done, basically. Um, so I'm going to see if I can plan that for some point, probably in November. It's never the nicest time of the year to be taking train trips, but, um, uh, but I will keep you guys informed as to what I do. I don't know if I'm going to get as far as Romania this time. But perhaps managing to visit some activists in Poland, at least that might uh, that might potentially work. Um, so anyway, thank you all. So bye from me for now. I'll log off. If you need to have a further conversation, so then um, uh, over to you. However, and um, I'll make sure the link is circulated around to thank my. You, my slide. Thank you so much. I'll I'll be calling you in. Uh, happily, in... happily. Thanks for being here. Bye for now. Thank you very much. Great. Um, thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you. Okay, my Polish brothers. Um, are we going to voice uh, more issues or we are about to close ourselves? Um, I think uh, maybe other guest wants to take a voice. Uh, take, I'm, afraid, uh, I'm afraid we had we had only Romania and Poland present. Ah, okay. <laughs> so there was supposed to be our... Podcast. And Germany, but... Uh... And Germany, of course, yeah, but I mean, from Central and Eastern Europe. I mean, Germany is Central Europe, right? Uh, sorry about that, uh, Marcus. And um, I had somebody from Lithuania. I mean, Lutauras was supposed to, to to join us, but he just couldn't uh, at the very last moment. Actually, we organized this 
exactly at the moment when OECD is presenting um, um, climate um, as a conference on climate anyway. So uh, yeah, it probably wasn't the, the best. Would have been interesting to have uh, Andras or Martin from uh, from the Clean Air Action Group in Hungary to okay. see. Andras, Andras didn't come. That, that's another bummer because so I we took the liberty to speak for Lithuania and uh, and uh, and Hungary, but uh, I'm, I'm sure they would have had. A... Okay, uh, I see Marta has a hand raised. Maybe she wants to say something. Sure, anytime. Or. Oh, no. Anyone? Um, right. No. So uh, yeah. Basically, what uh, Lutauras from Lithuania asked me to say, and I said it already, was this uh, component of uh, biodiversity and uh, respecting conservation <laughs> when you when you build uh, rail line, railways. And uh, the big issue with uh, the connection from Białystok to Kaunas would be exactly this you know so uh, uh, it's funny how a lot of uh, probably the vast majority of uh, environmentalists from Lithuania are you know drawing the attention towards this uh, but uh, yeah it's too bad they're not here I, I took the train there it was really fun but it was like going back I don't know 30 years uh, the speed was like as you said Bukash uh, bicycle speed really yeah, that's right. Actually, it's also a pity that we don't have anyone from Czech Republic because I think it's a very important country. But I, I, I saw the same, the same thing in previous uh, workshops. So it's pity. Uh, together with Piotr, we, we will be thinking uh, about how to reach these uh, NGOs because I think it's it, they are very important, but for now we don't have a strong connection with them so i think a big problem uh in in talking about this is uh um uh, well first of all a lot of ngos don't have a lot of capacity in in in, uh, in romania for example there aren't many people working specifically on um you know furthering these transport issues actually there are very few uh, except for us that are uh, that are interested in uh, well some of them are interested in transport infrastructure you know some of them are interested in um, national railways but uh, we're very discombobulated so to speak so uh, I think um, m m making an effort to you know re reach across the pond so um, also in terms of reaching uh, and NGOs here in Romania, but also in the Czech Republic and, and, and Hungary and sort of uh, building this uh, uh, building this grassroots style, right? So um, um, instead of um, just, uh, you know, the, doing the workshops and then we, we need to uh, reach out to each other a little bit more. Yeah. and see how we can work together Hi, we we have this uh, um, central and eastern europe branch of the climate action network europe that we're part of and uh, um, probably i was thinking we will be able to, to to use that you know and we tried to use it but uh, apparently nobody joined uh, i think it's a question of capacity a lot of times and uh, also yeah. But also, it's, it's the question that transport is not there. I mean, everybody's obsessed about energy now, but that energy is being burned in the bloody trains, you know, uh, or whatever, cars, okay, buses. So uh, maybe we should think for uh, organizing ourselves in Central and Eastern Europe more thoroughly for the remainder of the uh, project. Actually, the project is not. Uh, it, it's, it has barely started so um yeah what do you think guys oh. well, it's a tough question uh, actually i don't have a reception for this uh in one hand uh, yes as you as you mentioned uh, we start the project in the second hand uh, our project started uh, previously. Also, we tried to get, for example, to Czech Republic or Slovakia. And 
I, I had a direct connection uh, to a few NGOs and then uh, they didn't show up. So uh, it's very tough. Uh, it's hard to say uh, why they didn't decide to, to, to get to, to our uh, meetings, especially the Czech Republic uh, in a uh, few years ago they had a uh, strong NGOs connected with transport. So I don't know what, what's going on. So it's, it's very difficult, but especially that, uh, that we must connect with uh, these countries. Also, I think it's very important to reach to uh, Baltic states, definitely, because uh, yeah, yeah. in our coalition, we are represented Central and Eastern Europe. And we know uh, better than our coalition what is going on in our region. So, for example, th there is uh, some differences between uh, us, between Spain, between France. We have different problems uh, connected with uh, trains and uh, European uh, rail. So, I think it's the most important, but actually, I don't know how to reach them yet. I think it's important to highlight that, you know, uh, we're trying to address emissions in, in, in transport at the European level uh, in, in tandem. So basically, uh, we're not looking at, you know, the trains are part of the solution for, for some of the international transport. But we're yeah. talking about all this reducing emission and you know, like shifting transport emissions. And I think it's important to keep that in mind because um, a lot of the times, uh, you know, just talking about cross-border links between between trains and, you know, the overarching problems that you have, the bottlenecks the, uh, in, 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 in rolling stock. And I, I had no idea before, um, you know, coming, coming into this project. It all was more of a rail buff. But uh, I had no idea coming into this project. You know the the um, the the uh, the amount of uh, uh, hurdles that you need to uh, jump over in order to have um, um, more efficient. You know, the, like cross border connections. Just to just to have those connections, uh, I I wouldn't I didn't imagine that it would be so uh, difficult and it's 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 such a technical there's there's such technicality to these aspects but there's also you know the the marketing and uh, you know how do we procure rolling stock and and, and so on so yeah. it just makes it more important for people working on you know the decarbonizing other uh, transport sectors from the from the from the passengers. Uh, perspective to at least get the gist of what's happening with rail and cross-border connections in 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 europe um because it connects to this whole discussion about uh, uh decarbonizing uh decarbonizing transport so maybe there's a way of making uh this discussion um a lot more interesting for 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 people that don't want to get into the technical uh, aspects or don't have time to um but uh uh we should get the out our arguments out there of how this connects to maybe uh their work yeah it's true definitely okay raul we have uh almost uh noon so i think we should oh, basically the time is up um i um i'm looking forward to the other ones hopefully you guys are looking forward to our um, paper on romania and um and i guess uh, i'll see you around huh okay. yeah yeah uh, that's it thank you very much for joining us thank you Lukash. thanks everybody thank you piotr um Thank you too. Ciao, bye bye. <laughs> Ciao, see ya. <laughs> bye.